The Grinch is an absolutely disgusting character. Why the heck do we even like him? You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. You give kids cancer. Seriously. After first being published in a children's book in 1957 and later seen in a television special in 1966, why should we care about this holiday curmudgeon? There's an entire song about how dank nasty this guy is. You're as cuddly as a cactus. You're as charming as an eel, Mr. Grinch. Plus, he stole Christmas. Why would we let him anywhere near this merry time of year? He's like one nativity scene away from disgracing this tradition. But that's just the thing. The Grinch is not just a character and story important to the work of one Ted Geisel, the legendary Dr. Seuss. He's an established figure in how we celebrate and interpret Christmas to this day. The Grinch may have once stolen the gifts and decorations that are associated with the holiday. He could never actually steal what's important about Christmas, though. In fact, let's unpack this. Why does the Grinch capture the imaginations and holiday cheer of people and kids all around the globe? Except in the Middle East. Maybe. Number one, he's unconventional, but relatable. I must find some way to keep Christmas from coming. The Grinch is a different kind of creature when compared to any other character associated with Christmas in popular culture. At first glance, he doesn't represent anything positive about the holiday. He's described as mean, physically repulsive, and literally almost heartless. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. He's the only one in the story that absolutely hates Christmas. I think that part of the appeal is that we all really know someone very similar to the Grinch in a way. Some holiday Scrooge that, for some reason, is very hostile towards the holidays. Perhaps for the entirely wrong reasons. There's, oddly enough, one human element to the Grinch when we meet him at the beginning of his story, and that's in Max the dog. Why does this guy have a dog? Of course, as a villain, he would have another character to work off of and provide reactions. What I find interesting is that, in the creation of this character, Dr. Seuss went with not a minion, not a son or nephew, but with a dog. Like a real world dog. Doesn't that kind of reinforce that the Grinch is more of an estranged neighbor or family member more than anything? You probably have someone in your family or town that's old and complains with some sort of pet, right? As I said at the start of this video, the Grinch is a very odd character compared to Santa Claus, Jesus Christ, Rudolph, or whatever. Santa and Jesus are presented as characters of moral virtue and kindness in their stories, but not the Grinch, at least as we like to know him. The only holiday character that I can think of closest to the type of the Grinch is Ebenezer Scrooge from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Humbug. We know that Ebenezer is very famous for his hatred of Christmas and his love for money, so much so that we call anybody in our own lives a Scrooge for having either of those qualities, sometimes even around Christmas. And I bet I know what you're thinking, and I think that's awesome that you bring that up. But let me put a pin in that, and we'll come back and revisit it, okay? Okay. Just don't use the rest of the pins to pick at your siblings. Scrooge and the Grinch are two holiday characters that are cherished partly because they are so different from most other holiday entities. They are relatable and present moral flaws in their stories. But that's only half of the puzzle and only a piece of the appeal. Number 2. We relate to a character with motivations and a plot with a multi-part task and goal. A great story is key. So we have a sense of who the Grinch is at the beginning of his story, but story and plot, both aren't really the exact same thing, are also important components to the Grinch's likability. I mean, what are characters if they don't do anything? Almost nothing, right? The important tools of storytelling since the beginning of storytelling have always been the problem of want versus need. Characters in a story set out with a goal or something they want in their world changed. A good story entices us with the character's journey to reach that goal in the structure of a plot. The smaller details, like character and other things, make the story all the more interesting and nuanced. 
A character can be good, evil, or any combination of the two. Use your powers for good. Heads up. But what makes their story engaging is how it's presented to us and what other elements it comes with, like theme, motif, etc. In the book and the 1966 special, the Grinch's arc follows a three-act structure, something I know you've heard of if you're watching this video. The first act is the setup, where we know what we need to know about the Grinch, Whoville, and Christmas in the setting. Hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. And their shrieks, squeaks, and squeals racing round on their wheels. All oh, the noise, 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 noise. Once the Grinch realizes a way to save himself from the annoyance of the Who's Christmas nonsense, he starts to enact his plan of stealing all the Who's things for the holiday, the beginning of Act 2. Act 2 is pretty much the entire process of how the Grinch steals Christmas. From becoming Santa Claus, to stealing all the Who's gifts and decorations, to succeeding in his goal of stealing Christmas. The scene with Cindy Lou Who is a moment where the Grinch is challenged in his goal. It's also an instance where the plot slows to provide some character to the Grinch, where he shows kindness to the young girl even though he's being very deceptive. Take Santa Claus' life. There's a light on this tree. There's a light on one side. So I'm taking it home to my workshop, my dear. I'll fix it up there, and I'll be back here. Act 3 is when the Grinch is thought to have succeeded in making the Who's miserable, the climax of the story, when Dr. Seuss pulls a bait and switch. The Grinch learns that Whoville is still celebrating the holiday, perfectly fine with just having each other. The Grinch comes to the revelation of what the holiday is all about, and... Take it away, Mr. Karloff. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. The Grinch saves the Christmas goodies from destruction and decides to return them to Whoville, and the story ends happily. The Grinch joins in on the festivities, knowing the true meaning of the holiday. For one reason or another, we're a species of storytellers. Evolved trait or otherwise, it is in our DNA that we share, consume, and communicate by telling tales. We love stories of just about anything. Think about your interactions with the people in your life and think about how you talk about certain things. You and your friends could be a natural mother goose, right? The Grinch is a story that is simple to understand. People of all ages have read the tale and know it by heart. It's not Lord of the Rings or War and Peace, but the most important works of art aren't required to be. The Grinch really feels like a Christmas carol for the Christmas of today. A big deciding factor between Scrooge and the Grinch, however, is while the Grinch loathes the materialistic aspect of the holiday, Scrooge loves it. People spending money on the holiday provides him with more debt to collect for the 9 to 5, after all. Christmas is a very busy time for us, Mr. Cratchit. People preparing feasts, giving parties, spending the mortgage money on frivolities. One might say that December is poor closure season. Harvest time, pretty much does. Scrooge's story deals with his character of the past the present, and the future, his relationships with the people in his life, and even himself. In a supernatural encounter with the undead and some spirits, something not uncommon with the mythology of this holiday, he learns that his actions have consequences, and to be a better person in this one life he'll knows he'll get. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> you know, It's a Wonderful Life works in a similar fashion. It's odd how Christmas brings that out. I'm the answer to your prayer. That's why I was sent down here. Clarence Artbody, AS2, Angel Second Class. The Grinch's story is more of a commentary on the commercialization of the Christmas season, something that was ramping up intensely in Dr. Seuss's lifetime and especially when he first penned the story in 1957. Part Christmas Carol, but also part Aesop's Fable in a sense. It's a tale with a moral. A moral concerning the nature of the season, of what it has become, and what it should be. The most engrossing stories often have something about their world feel different than how they started out. Whoville just gained a couple of new friends by the end of the book. How the Grinch Stole Christmas is a book that deals with subjects that do relate not just to the America of the 1950s, but of 2018 as well. It provides a character that is compelling and a tale that is simple to understand, but important to be reminded of. So, okay, The Grinch is deservedly one of the most important stories of the holiday season, and it might just become more important as the century rolls on. <sighs> Dang it, did I just answer my own question at the beginning of this video? Well, that's YouTube for you. What about the 2000 live action version? With Jim Carrey as The Grinch, you ask? Come back to me on that. Hello, Hulk. 
Okay. Now pucker up and kiss it, who bill! <laughs> Hi, this is Austin, and I want to thank you for watching this video. If you want to watch a video on Spider-Man's Venom and his history throughout his movies, go ahead and click the end screen title card there, and if you want to see more pop culture videos and stuff, be sure to subscribe and uh, do all my social media in the description below. I'm out. Peace. Goodbye. Mwah. I love ya.